I'm Greg Gochnauer, and I am a beekeeper. And when I was young, I collected insects and basically was always fascinated with the little creatures and wanted to keep a hive in my yard when I was growing up in Wheaton. But uh, my parents had a neighbor that was allergic, and so they kind of uh, said that wouldn't be a good idea. So when I got my first teaching job, uh, I actually was able to buy and put right on the side of the campus uh, a hive of bees and started uh, working with students on that and saw how fascinating it was and how the kids were very interested in it and uh, that kind of kicked off my interest in doing it a little bigger and bought some hives from there and kind of started from there. Okay, bees uh, forage, meaning they fly out from the hive here and they go visit the sweetest thing they can find by smell and by taste. Uh, generally, uh, right now, this is August, so we're looking probably at some goldenrod uh, being involved and some aster flowers. Um, and they will sip the nectar, which is basically sugar water, from the flower itself and, and load that up as much as they can in their honey crop. And they will fly back to the um, to the hive, so they're called field bees. They work the field. They come back and they hand that off. They blow that stuff out, sort of regurgitate it out to the young bees in the hive. And then basically the, what they do is they ingest this and blow bubbles with this nectar and gradually evaporate the water content so that it becomes uh, between 16 and 70 percent water. And then uh, it's pretty much um, thicker at that point. And then they hang it in the cells of the honeycomb. And uh, when they fill up the cell, then uh, they will cap it. And it's sealed just like a can of food or a canning jar and is well preserved. And they've even found it in Egyptian tombs, capped and lasted thousands of years as long as nothing else got into it. Honeybees are uh, crucial to um, the ecological uh, life on Earth. And for particularly humans, uh, they're very beneficial because we eat the food that they pollinate. Uh, many, many uh, uh, vegetables and fruits are pollinated by, by honeybees. Um, I think it's something like uh, $19 billion worth of agriculture is uh, influenced by honeybee pollination. Um, most notably, probably almonds in California is an example, oranges in Florida, and many, many other products that we eat. Um, for humans, also we use uh, products from the bees. Uh, we use not only the honey, uh, people do eat pollen, people eat royal jelly, uh, people make various products from honey, everything from cosmetics to uh, um, lipstick and things like that. Uh, and then people use the wax. They've used that for uh, since ancient times for um, beeswax for everything from candles to different kinds of uh, finishes on furniture and, and waterproofing and things like that. Uh, in a colony that's established, uh, much like the ones nearby here, uh, they probably have close to 100,000 bees in them at this time of year. Um, there is one queen who is the uh, head matriarch and lays all the eggs, uh, controls the bee behavior with her pheromones, which um, are influenced by the nectar flows, uh, pollen they bring, and things like that. Um, the drones, which are the male bees that uh, basically are uh, not helpful at this time of the year, uh, this is August. Uh, they basically are there in case the queen were to die and a new queen were to be able to hatch and uh, they would fly out and mate with her. Um, so their, their predominant role is strictly for mating. Uh, in terms of the hive work, they do virtually nothing. Uh, the worker bees, which is the other 99,000, well, if we're having a hive of 100,000, so say late 98,000 bees, uh, pretty much do everything. They clean the hive, they cool the hive, they protect the hive, they make uh, the runs to forage for nectar sources and bring it back and ripen that to um, honey that's placed in the comb. The young bees uh, take care of the young brood, which are the young bees and eggs that the queen has laid uh, and are growing into adult bees. And uh, they um, um, cap the honey and uh, use the pollen and honey to feed young bees. So they are the app appropriate name of the workers. They, they do it all. Uh, Going back, the female uh, worker is a sterile bee. It doesn't have um, egg-laying ability unless the queen vanishes. And then uh, the drone is pretty much for fertilization of the queen, and the queen is the egg layer. So those are the three kinds of bees in there and what they do. 
Okay, when I first started, um, I was single, and then I got married, <laughs> and I had bees other places, because uh, we didn't have a place when we were first married to put bees. Um, so I've had friends or whatever that I've known let me keep bees in their area. And then as I had children, um, they enjoyed uh, eating the honeycomb that I cut off the combs when we extracted honey. And uh, I have lots of pictures of them from uh, honey fairs where we entered uh, uh, pictures of beekeeping and that kind of thing and where they were involved. Um, uh, my oldest daughter is uh, my biggest honey consumer and she still eats honey. She lives in California and every time we get together she wants me to bring her more honey. So uh, they've been sort of participating but pretty much I do most of the work and uh, you know they might help out a little bit sometimes here and there with uh, some of the techniques of putting honey in jars or something like that but basically it's pretty much me. Okay, in our area here, which is the suburbs of Maryland, uh, it's a really rich area of floral sources. Um, if you start in the early spring, uh, the first big source they get is pretty much uh, dandelion. And then uh, that usually occurs uh, March, late March. Uh, then you'll get into um, the, the tree flowers, which are the major, major uh, nectar loads that they bring in. And there are pretty much uh, two sources they get around here. They get black locust. Uh, which is the tree right behind here. And they also get um, tulip poplar in certain areas, uh, like down by the White House. Uh, they get holly honey, uh, because that's a predominant uh, plant that yields nectar there. Uh, and then there's sort of niche sources, different places. They'll get uh, fields of clover uh, work, white clover. Um, if certain trees are on boulevards around the area, they'll get uh, lindenwood, or it's also called basswood nectar and make honey from that uh, and then sort of by mid-June it kind of shuts down okay the honey uh, is stored in the beehive in in the honeycomb so to get it out there are lots of different ways the easiest way is basically to extract it so you take uh, some kind of knife or a uh, decapping fork and scrape off the capping and that opens up the, the cell of the honeycomb the honey is located in that and you centrifuge it out using an extractor and then you can replace the empty combs and the bees can refill like a return of a bottle. Um, other people cut the comb out and put it in box comb so it has the wax and the comb combined. Some people will um, press it uh, and just squash all the, the wax and squeeze out the honey from there uh, and strain it and bottle it up from that. Uh, that those are the predominant ways people get the honey. Okay, the, uh, the honey from this area is, is some of the best honey in the world. Matter of fact, I think it is the best honey in the world. Uh, partly is because of the nectar sources and blends of nectar sources that our bees forage right here in this area. Um, there are distinct honeys, as I mentioned earlier. We have dandelion, uh, black locust, uh, tulip poplar, uh, white clover, maybe some basswood, and then some fall aster kinds of honey that are a little uh, darker. So each, each honey has its own texture with the pollens that's maybe mixed into it, uh, water content uh, that may be at the time because of the weather and humidity. Um, so the, the separation of those and also the blending of those tend to make this honey uh, very superior in my opinion both for taste and texture and it's outstanding honey. Okay, in this present uh, time period where we live in uh, the United States, um, there are lots of issues about climate changes, um, some of which have been uh, monitored by satellites. There are several people that have studied this and they think that the uh, actual blooming or the greening and blooming of uh, various floral sources that the bees get is actually um, coming earlier. Uh, this year was an exceptional year in that regard, but uh, you know it doesn't mean that uh, we're in a total climate change cycle where that's going to affect the bees, but they basically have skewed when they get the nectar. They have to have a high population of bees when those nectar sources are available in order to forage. So if the population rises after the flower blooms, and that you're not going to get any honey. So that has to kind of go into sync, and a lot of that occurs by the bees being cold-blooded, 
their body temperature uh, is affected by the outside and they will forage and plants will bloom based on that temperature. So they, they actually adjust pretty well. Um, the um, future of beekeeping in this, in this whole process to keep these ladies healthy and working and doing what they do, uh, you know, I think there's a, always a monitoring of uh, water sources, of uh, potential um, poisoning issues with um, what they might forage on. Uh, there have been some work done with different kinds of pesticides and when people spray to kind of limit bee damage uh, to populations by ingesting things that would be harmful to them. But basically, um, keeping colony healthy and strong, uh, monitoring for parasites, uh, anything that would cause a demise in the population at the wrong time of the year. Basically, uh, they're doing a lot of work now with uh, queen genetics, uh, with um, you know, controlling uh, what kind of uh, uh, sperm is being used for artificial insemination of bees or also just the wild bees that uh, are out from hives and apiaries that the drones will fertilize the queen with to kind of breed a bee that is a, a good hygienic bee, meaning it cleans itself off, knocks off these mites, drags out invaders, high beetles, uh, and such things to kind of keep the colony strong. And as long as those things are happening, uh, beekeeping is uh, going to go well. And I think because of this colony collapse issue that's occurred worldwide, but particularly, uh, you know, it's troublesome to migratory beekeepers whose their whole living is based on the honeybee. Um, these these uh, conditions of uh, keeping strong colonies are really, really important. And so they're looking for answers that aren't lots of pesticides and lots of things that you put in a hive to keep the bees healthy, but to make the, the genetics of the bees strong enough that they can resist and survive from one year to the next. With a, a good strong colony of honeybees, uh, healthy, uh, good foraging abilities, uh, these bees will do just fine surviving a long way past maybe the human race, who knows. Uh, but basically, uh, these guys are healthy, these ladies are healthy, and uh, that's part of the management of keeping them well uh, placed location-wise so they can get nectar and then managing the hive itself so that uh, they have what they need to get through the winter and move to the next uh, season. So um, I think uh, the other issue is just education. A lot of the media and uh, publications have talked about this colony collapse disorder of bees. Uh, people have sort of rallied and there are a lot more beekeepers now, particularly in this area, coming to um, start bees and they're uh, fascinating little creatures and uh, they're you know putting them in more locations so back to the uh, earlier question of uh, the decline of bees probably when we were young our first encounter with a bee was stepping on it running to the swimming pool in grass and bare feet um, that the numbers of those bees in terms of wild populations are non-existent so they're pretty much limited now to beekeepers themselves putting bees into areas where um, they live and work and collecting nectar sources from the local um, uh, plants that are around. And uh, that is growing and increasing, at least in this area and in the cities.